It's a pretty big step to go from modeling a soccer ball to modeling something a little bit more complex like a human head. And if you're new to modeling, it may seem like an overwhelming challenge because there's so much going on and it's a little bit easy to get lost in the details here. So we'll take a closer look at this model in a different video, but for now I want to use it to showcase the importance of topology. Topology being the structure of your model. So this looks like a pretty good representation of a human head. You know, it's got all of the major anatomical features, obviously a nose and whatnot, but even down to the crease that goes from the nostril all the way around the mouth to the way the lips are shaped, all of this is fairly accurate and could be considered pretty detailed. But if we were to hide our subdivision surface modifier here, you'll notice that this is actually a pretty low resolution mesh. And the reason that we can get such a good representation of a human head with very few polygons all comes down to good topology. And in this case, that comes down to using evenly spaced quads as well as smart use of edge loops and poles. So bear with me as we talk about these fundamentals. I know it might seem a little bit slow since you're itching to create stuff, but if you understand how to direct edge loops and the other things that we'll be talking about in the next couple videos, you'll be able to model pretty much anything that you set your mind to with just a little bit of practice. So before we jump into edit mode and break down the topology of this model, uh, I want to use the grease pencil to draw over the major forms of this human head. So I'll turn the subdivision surface modifier back on and I'll hold down D to draw with the grease pencil with my left mouse button. And I have that layer hidden. Let me delete my previous layers, add a new one. Um, there we go. And you can hold D and use the middle mouse button to erase. There we go. So what I'm going to do is just trace over some of the major features of this model. So for example, we have the brow coming in like that. We have, of course, the eyes going around the eyeballs. But notice not only you know where they are, but also what they flow into in a way. So this eyeball here, you can see that it flows out that way. This one kind of comes out and it creates that sort of wrinkle around your eyes that you might have. And then we also have the bags under the eyes like so. We have the bridge of the nose, how that connects to the tip of the nose. And what I want you to notice as you practice this, uh, I'd like you to follow along if you can. I, I just want you to practice finding the defining features of the face and which ones do you think are most important. We have the crease that runs along from the nostril down to the cheek and around the mouth here. Of course, we have the lips defining the shape of the mouth and how those flow downwards afterwards. We have this part of the lips, we have the bottom part of the lips, we have the chin, how it kind of creates that hump in the middle. We also have the jawbone here, which comes down, takes a turn, and goes around towards the chin. Let's see, we have the cheekbone here, which is an interesting one because at the top it comes in from the nose takes a turn and goes up like that, while over here, on the right side of the face, it comes in and moves downwards like so. And the nose, how that connects to the cheekbone right in there. And we also have the muscle that connects the cheekbone to the jawbone going down like that. We have the brow going across, across the head like that. We also have the top of the skull coming down like so. And we could spend some time, of course, creating all of these different outlines for all of the major features here. But what I wanted to do was just outline some of these really major features. Let me do this for the neck really quick as well. How this connects right in like that. And I'm just defining all of the really important features. OK, so let's stop there. And what I want to do is hide the mesh now just like that. And look at just the grease pencil strokes that we drew on the mesh. And you can see that this is pretty recognizable as a human face. Now it's a little bit weird because I didn't really do the top of the head or the ears or anything like that. But even just looking at this, you can immediately recognize that, oh, this is a human face. And so what I would call these are the major defining features of our model. These are the parts of the anatomy that we really need to be careful that we represent correctly. And so 
What's really interesting about this is if I unhide my model here and tab into edit mode, you'll notice something. And that's that our edge loops here pretty much exactly line up with the strokes that we placed. Now it's not quite exact because I was a little bit off on some of these. However, the direction that the edge loops are going exactly mimic the major forms of our object here. So we have edge loops that are going you know, around the bridge of the nose, down and then back up here. We have the edge loop that goes around from the nostril, down and around the mouth. We have an edge loop for the chin, an edge loop for the jaw, for the neck, the shoulder, and so on. That exactly mimics the underlying anatomy. But what I really wanted to show you is just how important edge loops are in defining the shape of our model. Now, one thing that you might notice is that some of these edge loops aren't straight. You know, they don't go all the way across. So loop might be a little bit of a misnomer because they don't necessarily loop all the way around. You know, some of them might like the loops going around the eyes or around the mouth. But a lot of them, let's say this one uh, going across the brow, stops at two points. And they stop at very particular points, and that is at what we call poles. Now, poles are just vertices that have three, five, or more edges connected to them. And we try to avoid anything more than five, so we try not to have six-sided poles or seven-sided poles and whatnot. Uh, but we do have lots of three- and five-sided poles in this model. Now, you may have heard about poles before, whether they're good or bad or how to use them and whatnot. But I just want to break them down here so you can understand the purpose of poles and how to use them intentionally. So we can look at a few of the poles that we have here. We have a five-sided pole. We have a five-sided pole right here. We have a three-sided pole here. Another five-sided pole there. One there. One there. And we have quite a few, so I'm not going to outline all of them. We've got a five-sided pole there, three-sided pole. Um, so there's a lot of them in this model. And if you're not looking for them, it's easy to miss them or mistake their purpose. So beyond just ending edge loops, which by the way happens because an edge is traveling along and it comes to a split in the road and it can't decide which way to go. Should it go this way? Should it go that way? It doesn't know. It's really indecisive. So it just sits down and doesn't move. Same thing down here. It comes to a split in the road, can't decide where to go. So it just stops. Now, what makes poles really important is not that they stop edge loops, but that they split edge rings. So you might remember that we can select an edge ring by hitting Control, Alt, and then selecting an edge. And that's going to select a group of edges that go along the flow of the mesh. And this is also very similar to a face loop, except that a face loop, if we select one of those, uh, also selects the edges to the right and to the left. But either way, I'll use face loops here just because they're easier to see but everything I'm about to say applies to edge rings as well. So we have a face loop here that goes up and, you know, from the neck, goes up and towards the eye. But if we select the face loop that's just to the right of that, you can see that it comes in from a different part of the neck, meets up with it here, and then splits off and goes up and around the brow. And the thing that's really interesting here is that anywhere where an edge ring or a face loop changes direction is always going to be at a pole. So you can see that here as well. So anywhere where this meets a pole is a place where it changes direction. It's going one way, hits a pole, goes a different direction, hits a pole, goes in a third direction. So how this becomes really powerful is this allows us to direct our edge loops along the major forms of anatomy. So for example, let's take a look at this loop here that defines the jaw. Of course, we don't want the jaw melting into the neck right here. So what we have it do is we use a pole very intentionally to turn and make that sharp jaw line right there and come down here and go through and around the chin. And that allows us to direct our edge loops in a way that they really define our features. Now, I mentioned earlier that it's good to have evenly spaced quads, and that's not something I'm going to talk about too much here. But I just want you to notice that when I mean evenly spaced quads, I don't necessarily mean that they're all exactly the same size or that they're all exactly squares because, you know, some of them are, you know, a little bit more rectangular than others, but we do want to keep them reasonably square shaped. But when it comes to size, you can see that our quads here on the shoulder are much larger than the quads around the ear or by the mouth or by the eyes. And 
all I want you to notice at the moment is that we're using the shape of the quads in proportion to the amount of detail that we need. So around the ear, we have quite a lot of detail. We need to have all of these intricate shapes, you know, looping into each other and whatnot. And so we need a lot more detail there. And same thing going around the nose and around the mouth. These are areas that either need detail in order to be shown correctly, or will need more detail and animation if you're going to close and open these eyes. It needs a little bit more breathing room to be able to stretch and contract. Now, moving back to edge loops, let's take a look at another example, because using edge loops to define the structure of our model is just as true for hard surface assets as it is for more organic things like this face here. So on this layer, I have another asset, and this one is a sports car. It's a little bit more complex, but I bet you could guess just by looking at this where some of the major defining edge loops are placed. So for example, you can probably guess that there's one going along this wheel well here, just like that. And if we were to look at the hood of the car, you could probably guess that there's an edge loop coming in along here, taking a turn and going towards the front of the car. Another one at the top here, because there's a sharp detail that's defining the shape going along there. And similarly, one that creates this little scoop out there. I apologize to all the car fans. I don't know all the technical names for any of these parts, uh, except for, you know, headlight, mirror, door. I got those pretty well covered, but uh, all the technical things about a car I'm really not familiar with. To take a look at a more complex example here at the back, you can see that, you know, there's a very sharp line coming in from the bumper here, coming up, splitting off, going in one direction, going in another direction. And so since we have areas where this is changing direction, you can reasonably guess that there's a pole somewhere over here. Same thing with this back here, where you have this line that comes in, but then it eases out and almost seems to go up the car. And that's how it creates that smooth scoop where the edge coming from the right side comes in and curves around the car and goes towards the front of the car, like so. And you know you can imagine that a line coming in through the middle also comes up. And so that way we're able to create this fairly complex shape. But if we tab into edit mode here, select that part of the car and erase my lines, or at least hide them, you can see that that's exactly what we have. We have edge loops coming along all of the major areas, and you can see that we have edge loops that are really close together, which make very sharp details when subdivided. And they come in and then spread out where we want this area to be a little bit more smooth. And anywhere where this is going to change direction is an area that we're going to have poles. Now, one more thing about good topology that I want to talk about is how it's useful for not just when you're modeling, but after you're done modeling. So here we have the face that I was looking at earlier, and let me turn on the wireframes here in object mode so that we can see exactly what we're working with here. And because we're using these edge loops to define the major anatomical features of this face, and we're using evenly spaced quads, it's a lot easier for us to animate. And so I've created a really simple, cheesy animation. Actually, the smile is a little bit creepy. Uh, it looks like when somebody says like say cheese and you have no idea what to do with your face and you just kind of like awkwardly smile that's exactly this face but regardless of the awkwardness of it when he smiles you can see that the wrinkles going up you know from the sides of the mouth going up around the nose since we have those edge loops there they're naturally bunched up in that area creating the creases and you know wrinkles that we would naturally see same with as the cheeks come up and you know, up towards the eyes, we're getting the areas where it's, you know, squishing up the fat under the eye and creating that deeper wrinkle, which is exactly what you would see naturally. So it's not taking a lot of work to get these much more realistic deformations because our edge flow is already following the anatomy. And so that makes it much easier to animate. And just for another example, if he has a bad day and gets much more angry, you can see wrinkles up his nose, and even doing that, you'll get the proper crease going around and down and around his mouth. It's very easy to wrinkle his brow since we have those edge loops that can, you know, contract and come closer together. And all of these different facial expressions can be achieved fairly simply with proper topology. 
So if there's anything to take away from this video, it's that good topology and good edge flow helps to accurately represent whatever it is that you're trying to create, whether it's a face or a car, or a train, anything that you're making, good topology will help represent that more accurately while also keeping things very, very simple in terms of density. And it's going to be easier to animate, easier to deform, easier to work with, easier to make changes in the future. Pretty much anything that's good that makes a quality model is going to be accomplished by good use of topology and more specifically, good use of edge loops and using poles to direct those edge loops.